my pleasure today to introduce to you our speaker, who is Maestro Reverend Brian Egan. I got that right? <laughs> he is a certified hypnotherapist, a Reiki master, Karuna Reiki master, Maestro Shaman from the Shipibo lineage from Peru, oh pranic energy worker, crystal bowl sound healer, mm -hmm. EFT practitioner, quantum touch practitioner, Sedona method practitioner, chakra cleansing teacher, Qigong teacher. He's also a, an ordained minister from the Aseni New Life Church. Has his Bachelor of Science in Psychology with a minor in Special Education. And he is the director of the Sound Healing Conservatory. He's been practicing and teaching spirituality for over 21 years. He's done a lot of work with children, families, and individuals, leading workshops, classes, and through individual and group sessions. He also designed and ran a children's spiritual summer camp for 13 years, which taught children many quantum, which taught children quantum physics, spiritual concepts, meditation, and mindful practices. So, with no further ado, please give a round of applause to Brian Egan. Hello. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I really want to take a moment um, to, to call in our friend who is here with us, Jenny. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you, you, you did a great job with the intro, but Jenny, Jenny has the best one. And <laughs> um, um, but, but yeah, I, I really, truly miss her. And I'm really, you know, honored that she connected me to this beautiful place and to this wonderful church and, um, and community. So um, we would like to continue that, uh, you know, holding her in our hearts today as we work on our hearts. So today, um, the topic that we have uh, that I had set up is for clearing the barriers to love. So what are our internal barriers to love? How do we stop receiving love in our life, in our experience? You know, how can clearing that just by making amends with ourselves, how can clearing that transform every part of your life? You know, first off, you know, just to keep it simple, our heart, uh, if you're not familiar with the, um, the HeartMath Institute, our heart gives off a frequency as to our current state of being. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's based on what our internal state is. If we sit in an internal state of fear, sadness, anger, feeling lost in the world, then we're sending out that vibration around us and we're calling in more of that energy into our life, whether we want to or not, because most people don't want to bring more of that into their life, right? <laughs> really? Like, no, like, honestly, like, you know, like, but we don't, we don't realize it, but we're participating in it. Yeah. You know, we're adding to it every moment, you know, um, with every thought, you know, every thought, what thoughts create words, right? It's from Lao Tzu. Words create actions, actions create habits, habits create our character, character is our destiny, you know, and so how we're showing up is, is how we feel inside. And so we're surrounded in a hall of mirrors in our life, right? By everything in us that might set us off, right? Every single thing is always there waiting for you to open your eyes and look at it again, right? So the most difficult things in your experience are always right there. And so are the easiest things, right? And which one do we choose every moment, right? We always usually end up going towards the easy pretty mm -hmm. often, you know? Well, somebody said yesterday at the, the fair that we did, they 80% um, of our thoughts are negative. Yeah. Think about that. And that's a general statement. And so, like, I was thinking about that, and I was like, well, we're really not that negative, are we? You know, like, are we? I mean, yeah, we, we kind of are. You know, and, and thinking about, you know, Dr. David Hawkins, he wrote uh, Power Versus Force. He talks a lot about layering and 
recording and categorizing the states of consciousness in like a, a chart that goes from zero to a thousand, right? So a thousand being like enlightenment. Your heart is completely clear. Everything in your experience is perfect. Everything's wonderful. All those things all the time, right? But that's not how things are in reality, right? So those people usually have to remove themselves completely from society to be in those states or even get close to those states. Mm -hmm. So back to the 80 percent right so in dr hawkins work he used muscle testing to test his theories and to get his information to get really solid you know spirit guided clear advice right and clear uh, recorded um you know recorded data so what he said uh, while he was still alive who knows maybe i i bet we've raised it a little bit we're getting there but he said society itself is about 210 and that's just about, that's, it's not quite at the, the space where you really start getting things back and, and healing and redeeming yourself. It's still in that really low state. It's kind of like a, a, an apathy state where we don't act. You know, and that's why a lot of society is kind of held in this paralyzing fear of like, what's next? What should I do? Should I do something? Where are we at? You know? Um, so the more that we can bring in love and break those barriers in us, the more that everybody in your experience, in your life, in your community, in our world can shift and make that step up higher, faster. Okay, so what I mean by that is, you know, <clears throat> thinking of the layers of self, right? So the three lower layers of self, the physical, right? The emotional, and then like the self-worth, right? So that picture of our confidence, how we show up in our physical, right? Those are our three lower layers of self. The next layer up is the heart. You know, in the chart, right, so talking back to Dr. David Hawkins and his chart, uh, the heart, being in your heart space, I think starts at 400. So we're not even, we're like halfway there. It's just like as a whole world, right? Halfway, only halfway to like where we can really all forgive and move forward. Yeah. You know, and because the heart is the point of redemption. It's where we say, hey, wait, this was horrible, but I still love I am still love. I can overcome anything that's been put in my path because I am love. Because that's all that there is. And those lower forms are just the places where love was misconstrued, love was not interpreted correctly, love was not accepted, um, love was betrayed. You know, and in those spaces we have to go back in and we have to make amends. We have to make amends in ourselves, in our own heart, in the, the damage we hold on both sides. Because, you know, when we hold damage in our heart space, we don't hold it just for the other person. We hold it in us, too. So if there was something negative that happened, you hold that frequency about that person, but you also hold it against yourself. You know, maybe for being a part of it or maybe for, for even entertaining it as a reality. You know, there's all kinds of parts to us that our lower self will hold grudges on forever. And those grudges show up in our body all the time because the body keeps score, right? We all heard that story in that book. That's a new one, right? Not new, ancient, right? But our body never forgets. And we hold those diseases and disturbances in our frequency when we don't make amends and forgive ourselves and let go inside of us as well as for the other parts to it. You know, we forgive our Big Mac, right? We got to forgive our, our chocolate milkshake. We got to forgive all the parts of us that are participating into our unhealthy reality, yeah. right? All the negative thoughts. Yeah. You know, did you wake up this morning and get get mad that you tripped over something or you bumped into something? <laughs> you know, we we do that all the time. Who are we mad at when we, when those things happen? We're mad at us every time, right? It's so a holding anger. Anger is one of those those evils that we have to get rid of in ourselves. You know, and stop holding it and stop keeping it and using that as our frequency to get love or control love from someone else. You know, these barriers that we create, they protect us when we build them and we make them, right? We make them as children. We're like, oh, I have to be safe in the space. So everything in my space has to block from that, right? I can't look at that world because that's too painful, right? And so we keep that and we keep that and we keep that and we get older and older. And then that's, that's, our, that's, that's us. You know, that's how we show up. That's our vibration. So the more that we can clear those internal barriers by making amends with ourselves, the farther we can go. You know, back to the same topic that I seem to talk about every time I'm here, but every time I'm everywhere, is getting to that point of redemption, you know, in us, where we can make amends and, and step up into the acting part of love 
that we're all working towards. You know, that community part where we're all, this is what we're building together because we're creating a world of love, not just my now, but your now too, and our now, and all the nows, right? So that's what we're working on. That's what we're working on together. So if you would, let's go within for a second. Everybody take a deep breath. Close your eyes. Just breathe out real slow. And I want you to notice inside yourself, just from what I said, what are your internal barriers to love? What can you pick up just immediately in your experience? So take a deep breath. Notice that space, whatever it is that you're blocking and not letting it, not letting it show up. And as you notice it, I want you to see it from the side that holds it and from the side that it was received at. Because both sides exist. And I want you to see all those sides and give them all compassion. That's what forgiveness is about. It's about compassion. Breathe out slow. Take another slow, deep breath in. Acknowledging that pain that we hold. It could be physical pain. It could be emotional pain. Breathe in deeper. As you're holding and watching what you're holding, tell yourself, I'm sorry that I held this. And breathe out with that space. I'm sorry that I held this. I'm sorry I've allowed this to be a blockage in my experience of love. Take another slow, easy, deep breath in. Looking at all the parts that you held to that pain from all sides of it. Breathe in more. And this part, this part's a little hard because you have to be willing to give yourself forgiveness because we all deserve it all the time. Slowly breathe out. Let yourself receive that forgiveness. Tell yourself, I forgive you. I forgive you for holding this. I forgive you for holding this pain. I forgive you for holding this sadness. I forgive you for holding this disruption in my love. Take another slow, easy, deep breath in. Deep into your belly, deep into your lungs. And breathe in some more. In that space, we're going to hold the highest vibration, that of gratitude. Seeing all sides of this and accepting it as an experience of love. Slowly breathe out. Giving yourself permission to move forward with love in your mind, in your experience. Holding compassion for others. Thinking of someone for whom you have a difficulty with right now. And finding that compassion you just had and take another deep breath. Surrounding them in that love right now, in that compassion that they need as well as you. Breathe in some more. You're going to slowly breathe out and send that picture as a bubble of love to surround that person and to surround you in this area that you're dealing with an issue with. Breathing out. Accepting that love as you're giving that love. Allowing healing. Allowing peace. Telling yourself, I forgive you because I love you. Hearing it in your mind, I forgive you because I love you. And letting yourself receive it. Slowly bring yourself back, recognizing the room and the space that we're in. Going back behind your eyes and rejoining us. To that practice that I just did, if you're not familiar with it, is Ho'oponopono. Um, just, you know, different angles to it. You can do it for other people. In Hawaii, they often have children do it for other kids when there's a conflict. Um, and I feel like both sides are super important. So doing that for the other situation, whatever it is, could be a situation, could be a person, could be a memory, you know, and then also do it for yourself, just like we just did. Okay, so today for uh, the reading, we're going to read from How to Know God by Deepak Chopra. So let's go, How to Know God, The Soul's Journey into the Mystery of Mysteries by Deepak Chopra. So if you're not familiar, we do uh, bibliomancy, which means 
and let the spirit tell us which page we're going to read from from the book. Okay, I have like a, a short stack of books that we pull from. So, okay, let's see where we go. This is page 152. And this um, chapter is called The Seven Stages of God. I think there is no doubt, however, that the saint sees the sinner inside himself. Just as the saint accepts evil as calmly as any other occurrence. It is reported by eyewitnesses that when Father Maximilian was being injected with poison by the Nazis, he used his last ounce of strength to bear his arm willingly to the needle. During those terrible days when he was trapped in a crypt with other prisoners, the concentration camp guards were astonished by the atmosphere of peace created around the Franciscan monk. This story does not mitigate the evil of Nazism, which has to be countered at its own level. But the working out of the soul stands apart. And at some point, the dance of good and evil becomes one. What is my life challenge? To attain liberation. When stage six dawns, the purpose of life changes. Instead of striving for goodness and virtue, the person aims to accept, or excuse me, to escape bondage. I don't mean escape by dying and going to heaven, although that interpretation certainly is valid for those who hold it. The real escape of stage six is karmic. Karma is infinite and ongoing. Cause and effect never ends. Its entanglement is so overwhelming that you could not even, you could not end even a portion of your personal karma. But God's force field, as we've been calling it, exerts an attraction to pull the soul out of the range of karma. Cause and effect will not be destroyed the most, enlightened saint, the most enlightened saint still has a physical body subject to death and decay. He still eats, drinks, and sleeps. However, all of this energy gets used in a different way. If you spent every moment turning every thought and action into good, an Indian master told his disciples, you would be just as far from enlightenment as someone who used every moment for evil. Surprising as this sounds, for we all equate goodness and God. The force of goodness is still karmic. Good deeds have their own rewards, just as bad deeds do. What if you don't want any reward at all, but just to be free? This is the state Buddhists call nirvana, much misunderstood when it is translated as oblivion. Nirvana is the release from karmic influences, the end of the dance of opposites. The visionary response enables you to see that wanting A or B is always going to lead to its opposite. If I am born wealthy, I may be delighted at first. I can fulfill any desire and follow any whim, but eventually boredom sets in. I will grow restless, and in many cases my life will be burdened by the heavy responsibility of managing my wealth. So as I toss in bed worried about all these irksome things, I will begin to think how nice it is to be poor. The poor have little to lose. They are free of duties on corporate boards and charities. However long it takes, according to Buddhism, my mind will eventually desire the opposite of what I have. The karmic pendulum swing, swings until it reaches the extreme of poverty, and then it will pull me back toward wealth again. Since only God is free from cause and effect, to want nirvana means you want to attain God realization. In the earlier stages of growth, this ambition would be impossible, and most religions condemn it as blasphemy. Nirvana isn't moral. Good and evil don't count anymore, once they are seen as the two faces of the same duality. For the sake of keeping society together, religions hold it as a duty to respect goodness <clears throat> and, uh, and abhor evil. Hence the paradox. The person who wants to be liberated is acting against God. Many devout Christians find themselves utterly baffled by Eastern spirituality because they cannot resolve this paradox. 
How can God want us to be good and yet want us to go beyond good? The answer takes place entirely in consciousness. Saints in every culture turn out to be exemplars of goodness, shining with virtue. But the Bhagavad Gita informs us that there are no outward signs of enlightenment, which means that saints do not have to obey any conventional standards of behavior. In India, there exists the left-hand path to God. On this path, a devotee shuns conventional virtue and goodness. One might give up a loving home to live in a graveyard. Some tantric devotees go so far as to eat decayed food. <clears throat> the left-hand path may seem like the dark side of spirituality, totally deluded in its barbarity and insanity. Certainly, Christian missionaries to India had no problem holding that interpretation. They shuddered to look upon Kali with her necklace of skulls and, and her fangs. What kind of mother was this? But the left-hand way is thousands of years old its origin in sacred text that exhibits as much wisdom as any in the world. They state that God cannot be confined in any way. His infinite grace encompasses death and decay. He is in the corpse as well as the newborn baby. For some, very few people, it is uh, to see this truth isn't enough. They want to experience it, and God will not deny them. In the West, our abhorrence of the left-hand path does not need to be challenged. Cultures go their own way. I wonder, though, what went through Socrates' mind as he drank the cup of hemlock? Is it possible, since he willed his own death by refusing to escape the court's sentence, that the poison was sweet to him? And Father Maximilian may have felt bliss when the fatal needle went into his arm. In stage six, the alchemy of turning evil into a blessing is a mystery that is solved by longing for liberation. So that's what we're doing with our heart, right? To bring this back around, right? We're liberating our heart from the pains that we've held against it. And in that liberation, we're clearing it. We're releasing it of the, the duty of holding that grief forever, of that pain forever, right? So thanks for uh, being a part of this and thanks for listening to me and thanks for being a part of the meditation today. I really appreciate you guys and really grateful to be here. So thank you so much.